Good morning. Thank you for coming. My name is Stuart Marks. I work in the Core Libraries team in the JDK group at Oracle. Um, so today's talk is optional, the mother of all bike sheds. I'm not really going to explain all that this is about, but the notion of the bike shed is that optional seems to be a pretty simple class, but it's generated email discussions far out of proportion with the amount that's going on in it, or the amount that's apparently going on in it. And it seems like under the covers or around the covers, there's a lot more that's going on than might meet the eye, hence this talk. So what I'm going to do is just go over the basics of optional, what it is, why it's useful, and show some use cases about it. And then show what I believe are the preferred techniques for using optional. Then I'm going to talk about some counterexamples or anti-patterns of what I call abstruse use or even abuse of, of the optional class and go through a set of examples of reasons, of, of, of ways that I believe you should not use optional. And then I'll get into some, a little bit of discussion about the design rationale uh, and that, that's, uh, that's where the bike shedding comes in. All right, optional. Why is it useful? So background is the optional type, which is a generic, uh, it's a generic type, was introduced in Java 8. And it's a very simple class. It can be, it's in Java util. It can be in one of two states. It can contain a non-null reference to an instance of type T, or it can be empty. Um, so, when an optional contains a non-null reference, we say that it is present. And when it doesn't have one, we say it's empty. And I think it's very important to be pretty, pretty consistent about terminology here and not say that an empty optional, not confuse the terminology and say that an empty optional is a null optional, because I think that, that really confuses the issue. Note in particular that a, an optional cannot contain a present and null value either non-null and present or empty. Or also we use absent as a synonym for empty. Now there are some primitive specializations of optional, optional int, long, and double. Uh, they're mostly the same. There are some, there are some minor differences. I'm not really going to cover them today. I'm going to focus on just the Java util optional class. So optional is an object in Java. And as you know, objects are referred to by references. And those references can be null. Never use null as the value of a reference to an optional. And so that's very important. So if you need to return, if you have a method that returns an optional, never return null from it. If you have a local variable that contains an optional, never assign that to null. So just don't do that. That basically defeats the purpose of using optional. So I have a, se a series of rules that I'm going to play out as I go through the presentation. So this is rule number one. Never, ever use null for an optional variable or return value. All right, why is optional useful? So I'm going to go back and when we were designing the Streams API, run through an example of where, where we ran into this, uh, where we ran into the need for something that was better, uh, that, 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 that we, we decided that we needed to have something better than simply returning null from some of the Streams methods. So here's, here's an example. Suppose you want to search a list of customer for some customer object that has a particular ID. Um, so this is a draft API. This is, not, this is not the actual API. This was something that, uh, in fact, I came up with it during the streams development. And kind of the obvious thing to do is to say, OK, let's have a search method that takes a predicate, and it finds a member of the stream that meets that predicate and returns it. All right, next question is, what happens if there is no member of the stream that meets that predicate? Ah, return null, of course. That's what we always do in Java. All right. so. Um, so let's use this in a method, customer by ID. It takes a list and a customer ID and returns a customer reference. And so we say custList.stream and then call search and pass it the predicate. Now, this, again, this is a draft API. This isn't, this isn't real, but this was our, one of our early prototypes. So what this means is that the null that's returned from this, this hypothetical search method is returned from this method. So customer by ID also, returns, or also can return null. And so we have null starting to propagate all around our system. Well, suppose we want to refactor this and say, OK, I don't actually want to return the customer. I just want the customer's name. And so we can call get name on that customer instance. So you might be tempted just to call get name at the end of that stream. Well, that's a problem, of course, because it's going to throw a null pointer exception if no customer is found. 
So what you have to do is say, okay, get the result from search, store it in a local variable, and then test it against null, and then say, ah, okay, so if it's non-null, at that point we can call getName. Um, and if it is null, then we do something else, like return unknown. And this is kind of a problem. So it's really cluttered. It, it totally broke up the, the, the fluent uh, style of the streams API, and it's very easy to forget. So you could very easily just call get name off the end of that and suffer a null pointer exception. So we decided we needed to do something better, and so the, uh, the idea was to create an optional class. And so here, this is actually sort of a back formation. There was a whole range of discussion of optional, and then distilled from that, Brian Getz and I sat down and wordsmithed a paragraph that says, here is what optional is for. So optional is intended to provide a limited mechanism for library method return types, where there's clean, clear need to represent no result, and where using null for that is overwhelmingly likely to cause errors. And so I think you saw that on the previous, uh, on the previous example. So that was the return type. Instead of returning a bare reference which might be null, we say, hmm, maybe let's do something different, return this optional thing instead. Again, that's in the return position of uh, a method signature, and where use of null there is likely to cause errors, or overwhelmingly likely, okay. Uh, but I think that is pretty true, right? Sometimes you call a method and you just say, oh, great, now I have one of these guys, I'm gonna call more methods on it. And, you know, if, if you forget that something's nullable, you can easily run into null pointer exceptions. So this is the case that we are focusing on. We are not trying to solve a much more general problem of, of a maybe monad or something like that, if you're a functional programmer. And most importantly, we are not trying to get rid of null references from Java entirely. Nulls are, nulls are out there. Optional does not replace null references. All right, so let's try to figure out how to use optional. So returning to this example, we have our customer list. This is the actual stream API that, uh, that ended up in Java 8. It's a little bit different. Instead of passing a predicate to the searching, or in, th in this case, find first, uh, we put the predicate in a filter operation upstream, and then call find first on that. And so find first does not return a customer. Instead, it returns an optional of customer. And so in our example, we want to get the name of that customer. So we can't call get name on it because optional does not have a get name method. So we get, we get a compilation error here. So what do we do about that? Well, um, we could take that optional customer from the stream and then do something with it in order to get the customer out of, out of it and then call get name on that customer object. So those question marks there say, what do, we do need, what do we need to do to get the customer instance out of the optional of customer? All right, well, there's a get method on there. Okay, that's great. Uh, so we get the, uh, we, we, we run our stream pipeline, get the optional customer result and store that in a local variable opt and then call get on that. And so now we have our customer and then call get name. All right, well, what's wrong with that? What if there was no customer? So instead of a null reference to a customer, now what we get back from the stream pipeline is an empty optional instead of an, an optional that has a customer in it. What happens if you call get on an empty optional? Well, it throws no such element exception. So we haven't actually helped anything here. We've replaced null pointer exception with no such element exception. And so, so now we are gonna launch into a range of use cases for how to, how to use the optional API effectively. But that's the setup for the issue, which is we have an optional that might or might not have some value. How do you work with that value that might or might not be there? In other words, we need to find a way to safely get a value from an optional. All right. Um, actually, let me take a quick, quick break here and, and talk about my, my Twitter thing here. Ah, good. Okay. All right. Now that... Um, so you see a hashtag up in the upper left. Um, I, uh, if you have questions on this, I think the easiest way to get them to me is to tweet them using this hashtag. And uh, so the hashtag is DevOps optional. And um, since everybody was saturating the network during the break, I wasn't able to get it on my iPad, but I have it now. So uh, I'm, not, I'm probably not going to be monitoring it during the talk, but when, the end, when, the, when I get to the end of the talk, um, I'll, I'll look there and see if there are any questions. Okay, with that out of the way, 
let's revisit our customer finding example. So we run our customer list stream and we get our optional customer out of find first. Now, we don't want to just call get on it because that gives you a null, uh, not a, sorry, not a null pointer exception. It gives you a no such element exception. But it still gives you an exception. So you need, you know, maybe one way to do this is to call is present before, um, before calling get. So you can do that. So there's a method on optional called is present, returns a Boolean that tells you what state the optional is in. Very good. So uh, if it's present, we can get the name, get the customer out of the optional, and then call get name, otherwise return some, some alternative string like unknown. So this works, but I mean, really, still, this is, this is no better than what we had before, because we've replaced a null check with a check to the call to is present. So again, this is, this is hardly any better than what we had before. So optional hasn't yet added any value. Meanwhile, I think this is the right time to introduce rule number two, which is never call optional.get unless you can prove that there is a value present in that optional. Um, and so I think that's very important uh, because if you don't do that, you get ex almost exactly the same problem with unexpected exceptions. You just get a different exception type. Instead of null pointer exception, you get no such element exception. All right, so there are cases, there are, there are in fact fairly common cases where you can, just because of the context of the code, that you can prove that there is a value present in an optional, and in those cases, it, it is safe to, uh, uh, to call get. Now, one of the problems with this, though, is that this style hasn't, I mean, it's bought us a little bit. It's bought us a little bit of safety because instead of getting a customer out of the stream, which might be null, we get an optional. So there's an extra object in the way. So you might be tempted to call customer methods directly on that return value, but it doesn't work because it's an optional instead. So optional is adding only a tiny bit of value here because it's reminding you, oh, you have to, the thing you want is actually inside the optional. So you have to do a little bit of extra work. But you're doing extra work here, and you're still cluttering up the code, and you, you have to remember to do that. And so it's not really, it's not really that useful. So um, this leads to rule number three, which is let's in, uh, prefer alternative method calls to optional is present followed by optional get. So I'm going to go through a bunch of examples of this. So, so if you look at the optional API, there are, I mean, like I said, there, it's, it's very simple. There's two states, present or absent. Oh, and I forgot to mention, it's also immutable. You can never set the value of an optional after it's created. But anyway, the states of the object are, uh, the states of the optional object are very simple, but there are like a dozen method calls on it, and some of them are kind of arcane. So that's what I'm going to go through next. All right. Uh, but anyway, so if you find yourself writing optional is present and optional get, sometimes there's, sometimes there's no way to avoid that, but in many cases, there are alternative methods that you can and should use. All right, so the um, so here's an example. There are three methods on optional uh, that start with or else. Uh, there's or else, or else get, and or else throw. And they take a little bit of getting used to used used to how to read these methods. But basically, if I have an optional and I call or else on it. That returns the value if it's present, but if the optional is empty, it returns a default value that you provide to or else. So or else get is kind of similar, except instead of you providing a default value, you provide a supplier for that default value. So what that, that allows you to use a lambda method or a, reference, uh, a method reference in or else get. And what happens is the, the creation or retrieval of that default value is lazy. It only occurs if the optional is empty. And there's another variant, which is or else throw, which takes a supplier of an exception. And so what that does is it returns the value present in the optional. But if the optional is empty, then it throws an exception that's constructed by calling the exception supplier. So more methods. So there's a map method on optional. So it's map in the sense of transform. And so let's, um, let's return to the uh, customer example. Um, get name. What we, we're not actually interested in the customer. We're interested in the customer's name. So this is, this is the example where we ended up before. And so we can rewrite this code like so. 
So instead of calling, instead of testing is present and then calling get on that optional, we call map and pass a transforming function which gets the name from the customer. And so that function is called only if there's a value present in the optional. And in fact, it's called, it's called on that value that is present in the optional and is expected to return a, a substitute value, which may be uh, of the same type or of a different type. But if the optional is empty, then map simply returns the empty optional. So it just passes it straight through. Now what you can do with this is chain or else on the end. And now it becomes a little clearer how, how you use or else. So what I'm saying, what this code is saying now is, okay, I might have gotten a customer from this stream pipeline, and I want to map it through the get name function, and, uh, or else if it was empty, return the unknown string. Okay, so now it turns out we no longer need the, um, to have a local variable here, so we can just merge this map and or else call onto the end of the stream pipeline. And now it's really starting to look much neater. We have a stream pipeline, filters, and does a find. Now there's a little bit of a wrinkle here in which the chain of method calls looks like a continuation of the stream pipeline, but it's actually no longer a stream at this point. The map and or else methods are method calls on the optional that was returned from find first. But anyway, this gets rid of a bunch of clutter in processing the, uh, the, optional, uh, the, the optional that's returned from the um, finding method. All right, so there's another, uh, another method on optional called filter. So this, this originally came out of um, OpenJDK. There's a, a layer.java file. Actually, it's been, uh, I've been told by the author of that file, one of the maintainers of that file, it's no longer, no longer the case, but um, this, it's an example of a pattern that I've seen elsewhere. So um, in this particular case, I'm gonna need to set up the example a little bit. We have, um, we have a configuration object and um, we want to look at the parent, the configuration object. Now, a configuration might or might not have a parent and the requirement here is that this configura configuration off, sorry, this configuration object must have a parent that is the same as this layer's configuration. So the, this, this is all part of a larger context on the objects, but it's interesting in that the, um, it's an interesting case because it, it shows a good example of the way that filter can be used. So here, all right, so, so, we, um, so if you look at the code, we have the configuration object and we get its parent, and so parent returns an optional configuration. So it might or might not have a parent. So what we wanna do is we wanna throw an exception if there's no parent, but if there is a parent, we wanna make sure it's the same one as, our, as, as you know, this object's configuration. Um, and if it's not, then in either of those cases, we want to throw an illegal argument exception. And that's what this code does. And it's, it's kind of okay, but it's one of those things where you have to, you know, you have to puzzle over the uh, Boolean conditional logic a little bit. So it turns out that the optional filter method uh, gets rid of a lot of this, uh, gets rid of a lot of this problem for you. So what, so what filter does is it runs, it takes a predicate and runs that predicate on the present value. And if that value meets the predicate, it, uh, it passes through an optional containing that value. So basically it just passes it through. In fact, it, re it, returns, it returns what it was called on. On the other hand, if the, if the present value does not meet the predicate, it returns an empty optional. Now a filter is called on an empty optional to begin with, then it just returns an empty optional. So basically what it does is, is, it, is it sort of temporarily opens up, runs the filter on the, the value in the, in the optional, if there was one, and um, returns a result indicating that. Uh, and so in this case, we want to filter for, the configura for there being a present configuration that is the same as this configuration, or else we want to throw an illegal argument exception. And so that's exactly what this code does. All right, so another method is if present, which is a bit unfortunate because it's very easily confused with a method I mentioned earlier called is present. Um, so here's another example from the JDK code base. 
Um, there's something that wanted to get a task from somewhere, and there might or might not be a task, so it got uh, an optional task. And, uh, but if there is a task, we want to, um, uh, we want to pass that to uh, an executor by calling run task on it. So here we have the typical is present followed by get. And so, um, like I said earlier, if you see is present followed by get, maybe look around for different methods on optional to, uh, to make that simpler. So here's one way of rewriting that. We can say get task, and instead of storing the optional in a local variable, we can just chain if present on it. And so what if present does is it says, if there's a value present, run this lambda expression on it. If, and um, if there's no value present, then it doesn't run it at all. And so that's exactly, that's exactly what we want to do in this case. So we can simply ca call get task and then chain if present off the end of that optional return value. And then we pass a lambda that does what we want to do. So now if you look at this lambda, then it, it just calls run task on that task. And so we can, this is, this is kind of standard stuff. This doesn't have anything to do with optional. We can just replace that with a method reference. And that makes this, this code you know, really nice and tight. All right, there are a few more methods on optional. Uh, they're kind of utility style, factory methods and stuff. Um, so, but basically, there are no constructors. There are no public constructors on optional. The way you get an optional uh, is you can either call optional.empty, and it returns an empty optional, or you can call optional.of t, and you must pass a non-null reference to an object uh, of type t, and that returns you an optional that contains t. Um, there is a flat map method, which is kind of like map, except that it instead of returning a value, it returns an optional that might contain the result. So um, there are, if you have a bunch of functions lying around that return optional and you want to, you want to do mapping on them, then flat map is what you want to do there. Um, optional also has equals and hash codes methods, uh, which, is, which is sort of obvious and uh, a little too easy to ignore. But it turns out equals is really useful for doing assertions in unit tests. So if you have a method that returns an optional, you might have a bunch of cases where, in some cases, you, so you might want to have a bunch of test cases where, in one case, the, the, the method should return an empty optional, and in another case, the method should return an optional containing an expected value. So it's typical unit testing. Well, there are a bunch of different ways to do it, and after playing around with some stuff, it turns out that you can just use assert equals, and you pass in the expected, uh, you, you pass in an optional that matches what you expect. And so you can say optional of expected value or optional dot empty, and equals does the right thing with that. All right, um, another technique that uh, is useful with optional is to, uh, sometimes it's useful to have a stream of optionals. So here's an example where, uh, so let's, let's uh, kind of resurrect this, um, this list of customers example. Um, so we have a list of customers, and we, um, <coughs> oh, sorry, we have a list of customer IDs, and we want to map, that, or we want to transform that into a list of customer. All right, so what we can do is we can take that stream and map it by customer, dot, uh, you know, customer find by ID. But notice, if you, if you recall from the example before, find by ID returns an optional containing a customer, not an actual customer. So now we have a stream of optionals, which is, which is, a, little, which is a little interesting. Um, so how do we deal with that? Well, what we can do is we can filter the, uh, filter the stream using optional is present, and then we can map that using optional get. And so here, again, we're, it's actually it's like kind of a different case. We are calling optional is present before optional get. Uh, and instead of doing this in an ordinary if statement, we're doing it in a stream, but this is adhering to that rule that I mentioned earlier, which is that only, you should only call optional get if you can prove that the value is present. And in fact, that's exactly what the filter upstream does. So this is a, this is a nice technique. And then anyway, so, so once, we, once we've filtered the stream to have only optionals that are present, then we get the customers out of them. So we transform a stream of optional of customer into a stream of customer, and then we just collect those into a list. So that's what the top half does. Now, a little preview of Java 9. Um, 
optional has a stream method on it that returns a stream containing zero or one elements, depending on whether the optional is present or, sorry, other way around. It returns a stream of zero or one elements, depending on whether the optional is empty or present. And it turns out this, this is exactly uh, matches what the stream flat map method wants. It wants a stream that is interpolated into the outer stream. Or it wants to call a function that returns a stream whose values are interpolated into the outer stream. So you can collapse the filter and map methods into a single flat map call. All right, um, so optional is new, and so there might be pieces, if you start using it, there might be pieces of your code base that are using optional, but you might have some older code that still uses null, and so there's a need to adapt the nullable world to the optional world. And so you need to go in both directions. Um, so if you have a nullable reference and you need to get an optional out of it, there's another static factory method, optional.of nullable. And so in, instead of, unlike optional.of, where the argument you pass must be non-null, this allows a null reference to be passed in, and a null reference is converted into an empty optional. Uh, and of course, if the reference is non-null, you get an optional containing a value. Now, if you need to go the other direction, if you have an optional and you want to pass, if you have an optional that might or might not contain a reference, and you want to pass that to something that either takes a reference which may be nullable, then in that case, to go the other way, you call optional dot or else null. Um, so I would say that only use or else null if you need to generate a null value that to, to something that is expecting nulls. Um, sometimes I see this is overused. People people like people are comfortable with null references, and so after they after they finish using the the, the this new and uh, this this. This new and unfamiliar optional API, they want to get back to their, their comfortable null reference world. So I see a lot of or else null. And so I would say, so it's, it, it's not as strong as one of my style rules, but I would say generally um, don't use or else null unless you really need to get a null reference that you pass to something that is expecting null. All right, so that ends the section about my uh, preferred, uh, preferred usage of optional, and now I'm going to start talking about optional anti-patterns and misuses. All right, so one of the things that, uh, that, that, that I think people find strangely attractive about optional is the ability to chain methods. And you know, this, this idea of chaining methods is pretty cool, but uh, it's very easy to overdo it. So here's, here's an example of of a code pattern that I, that I see um, all too frequently, which is I have some method that takes, uh, takes a nullable reference, and ooh, instead of using conditionals, let's, uh, let's use this new optional thing. So the first thing the code does is wrap it up in an optional using optional of nullable, and then start chaining methods on it. And this is really simple. There's only, there's only two methods in the chain. So, but, but you think about this. This wraps it up in an, in an optional and then calls or else get, which, which invokes some function if the, op if the value is present. Otherwise, it does, uh, <coughs> otherwise it does nothing. And um, it's not clear to me that this is any better than just, you know, if you, than just doing a null check. If you have a method that might take a nullable reference, check it for null. Um, so rule number four. Uh, Generally, I think it's a bad idea to create an optional for the sole purpose of chaining methods on it at the end of which you unpack the value. So I think, again, the, the issue here is that this is, this is kind of an off-label use of, of optional. Our primary focus in creating optional was for return values for methods. So if you find yourself creating an optional for use solely within the context of a particular method, that's, that's a pretty odd thing to do. Um, and in fact, I don't think it adds any value. So if you, if you look at this example, I mean, you can imagine, I'm, it's pretty easy to find uh, examples of more complicated code uh, where people will wrap something in an optional and chain a bunch of methods on. In fact, I have some more examples um, coming up later. Uh, and I think this, this subtracts value from the code. Uh, it makes it harder to read and understand, and it actually uh, creates, uh, 
uh, it actually allocates objects where, not, where no allocation is necessary. All right, so another thing that uh, people are fond of, of, of uh, misusing optional for is avoiding, uh, avoiding ordinary uh, if statements. So this is, this is a little weird example, um, but I found this on Stack Overflow. You can see the link at the bottom of the page. Um, but some guy, had, um, some guy had an issue, or he had a use case where he had two optional of big decimal, okay? But he wanted to combine them in an odd way, which was he wanted to add them together, and there was a special case where if, if one or the other value was present, then treat, treat an absent big decimal as zero. But if both values were absent, then, you, then he wanted the returning optional to be absent. So that's a little odd thing to do, but that was his use case. And so there was a long discussion and some pretty bad answers, I thought, quite frankly, on Stack Overflow. So, so here's, here's one of them. Somebody said, oh, I know, you can take, you, can, you have these two optionals, so you can, you can put them into a stream, and then you can filter them for being present, and then since we know they're present, we get them and then reduce using big decimal colon colon add. Okay, that's, that's pretty clever. Um, and, oh, it's nice, it's generalized. You can, if, you have, if you have three or four or an arbitrary number of optionals, you want to combine that way. Um, what is not at all obvious is if both, if both optionals are empty, then filter filters them out, returning an empty stream, and reduce returns an empty optional. So this matches the requirements that the original poster stated but it's completely non-obvious from looking at this. So reduce, in fact, can return an empty optional if it's, it's called on an empty stream. And so I, th I really think this style of coding obscures the logic uh, incredibly badly. And so I would, uh, I think I, this, is, this is a, a kind of coding pattern that one should avoid. It's, it's one of these patterns that I think is clever, but it's, it's too clever for its own good. So continuing with this, here's another one, and I'm not even going to try to explain this. Uh, but this, this works. I believe this, this is correct. It meets the original questioner's um, uh, requirements. But if you look at what it does, is it calls map on the first optional, and then it passes a lambda expression that calls map on, a, on the second optional, and also chains or, or more methods um, <clears throat> off the end of it. And then it wraps up the result in another optional. So that's very interesting. It's mapping something to optional colon colon of. Very strange thing to do. Or else it returns a section option, uh, second optional. So this is, this is incredibly clever. It's, code, it's, it's great code golfing. So if you're, if you're having a code golfing contest, I think this guy is the winner. But man, I, in order to figure out what this is doing, I had to haul out a piece of paper and write a state diagram and figure out what the what, what the, the potential results of every possible input at every possible intermediate expression was. And so you want to talk about obscure code. I, you know, if you're, if you're interested in this stuff, prove that this is correct and meets the uh, original problem statement. I believe it does, but I recommend never writing code this way. So, but I think there are some interesting rules that come out of that. And so in thinking about that, instead of saying, oh, this is bad code, don't do that, I think there are some rules that we can distill out of it. Um, and then here is actually, if I were writing that code in production, here's the way I would write it. So first I'll do that. And I think this is a strange enough case that is worth being, so, sorry, let me talk about the, uh, the original poster's requirements. So it has this strange thing where an empty optional might be treated if zero, as zero if there's another value present. But if they're both empty, then the result should be empty. So, um, so Given that requirement, I think it's a strange enough requirement that it's worth writing out the code more verbosely than you could, say, compared to what was on the previous slide. But I think it makes it absolutely clear what is going on and that this is a special case. And so write out an if statement and say, if they're both absent, return an optional empty. Otherwise, return an optional containing the result of summing them. OK, that's longer, but I think the code says exactly what it does. So now, if you if you recall the previous code, what I think made it correct, uh, what what might what I think made it complex, was a couple things were going on in it. So one was, it did optional processing in the lambda that was nested inside the processing of another optional, and that that's kind of that kind of caused my my internal stack to overflow. 
Uh, so that's why I had to pull out the piece of paper and, and, and map it all out. And I think that's, it's really hard to reason about because there's just so many, so many potential things going on. Um, the other thing is if you're processing optionals and you ever find that one of your intermediate results is an optional of optional of t, it's like, hmm, that's, that's kind of a little strange. I, I, I mean, it works, but I, I'm trying to think of a, 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 an intuitive model for what an optional of an optional is. So it's, it's pretty strange. So anyway, so that's what I'm proposing as rule number five. If you, if you have an optional chain that contains a nested optional chain, or if you have an intermediate containing an optional of optional of t, then you're probably trying to do something that's too complex. Maybe break it up and use explicit control flow or explicit testing. All right, so I wanted to switch subjects here and talk about a problem with optional.get. And there's this wall of text here, which I'm not going not to bother to read, but you'll see it in the slides. So last year at um, Jack's conference, um, Angelica Langer had an uh, interview with Brian Getz, who's the language architect at, uh, in the uh, Java language architect at Oracle. And she asked him what his biggest regret with Java 8 was. And and Brian just went off on this rant about optional.get. And so you saw some of the pitfalls with optional.get. But I, I really think there's something going on here, which is get is such a simple, short, and obvious method name, and it's used all over the place in the JDK and in any, any container object that you might want to write. And it's usually totally innocuous. If you have a container and you want to get something out of it, great, you call it get. Totally obvious. The problem is, with optional, get is a trap, because it leads you into, it, it's so tempting to just call get, and it makes it very easy to forget how to handle the empty case. In fact, and that's, basically, it's the same problem as null references. And so, optional is an interesting class. We've, we've talked about some interesting coding styles and methods and, and lambda expressions and stuff. But if you look at optional.get, it's a magnet for misuse. And so I, I, you know, Brian has ranted to me a couple times about this, and I kind of didn't believe him. It's like, yeah, 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 Brian, you know, what, what's the big deal? And then what I did was, uh, oh, here, I actually, I actually explain what, the, uh, what some of these things are. Uh, I actually, actually did a survey of code in the JDK, and I did a bunch of, I read a bunch of code on um, grep code, and looked for uses of optional.get, and frankly, I was appalled. <laughs> um, there were a bunch of cases where people were calling get, and they weren't. Um, they weren't guarding it. And then there were other, a lot of other cases where it wasn't incorrect, and people were calling if present followed by get, but they were really uh, not, not at all taking advantage of the, the capabilities of optional. So in discussing this a bunch, and lots of mailing, lots of emails, and more discussions with Brian, I think you know, I've, I, I've come to the conclusion that I agree with Brian, that optional.get really is a problem. And I think if you look at, if you look at the definition of optional.get, it's actually very strange. It throws an exception if there's no value present. And I don't, you know, maybe, I'm obviously, in the billions of lines of Java code out there, maybe somebody else has written a get that, uh, uh, that throws an exception. But uh, that's very unusual. If you look at all the gets, you know, like on the collections framework or whatever, um, they don't throw exceptions. I mean, th they throw exceptions if you know, an index is out of bound or something like that. But this idea of throwing an exception if something is not there is actually, I think, pretty foreign to this concept of the simple get method that we usually have. Um, so there's been a bunch of back and forth on this and discussion. Uh, and so I'm working on a plan, which is to uh, introduce a replacement or a substitute for get that has a more explicit name, something like get or throw, or um, I think it would be worth having a discussion about what the, the substitute should be named. Um, and then get should be deprecated, because it's misused so often that uh, that's worth generating a compiler warning for that. Now, um, it won't be removed. As you know, in my alter ego, Dr. Deprecator has introduced uh, deprecation with a flag that says for removal. So get will not be removed ever. Um, but this would be an ordinary deprecation where it just generates a warning. But in fact, get is used actually too frequently, and introducing warnings for all uses of get 
caused uh, a lot of people to object because you know warnings are a pain to deal with sometimes. So, so we've kind of pulled back from that a little bit. Um, so this plan is not going to be executed in JDK 9. Uh, in particular, GET will not be deprecated in JDK 9. Um, if there's time, I'm not sure, I might be able to introduce a replacement alongside of GET in JDK 9 so that it's there and then maybe pursue this plan in future unspecified versions of uh, the JDK. But anyway, that's, that's the issue there with GET. I think there is something going on there. Uh, meanwhile, I uh, st strongly, strongly recommend that you look at the other methods on optional, and there's usually a way to use one of those to, um, to replace uses of plain optional.get. All right, so there's, uh, there's some other issues here. Um, I, I've noticed a tendency for people to want to use optional in a bunch of places where we didn't intend for it to be used. And, you know, that's okay, right? We, we were focusing on return values and people want to use it elsewhere. You know, I guess that would be okay if it were useful, but I think for some reason there's a desire for people to, 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 to do that. And if you look at the code that results from that, it turns out to be not useful or, or, or worse than the code was before. And so my recommendations are not to use optional in fields, in method parameters, or in collections. Um, so there's, I have some more discussion a little bit later on about fields, but um, uh, <coughs> there are a bunch of things about you know, when you have, when you have uh, you know, why are you tempted to, to use optional in a field? Well, maybe it's to replace, uh, maybe it's to replace a null value. And Actually, I'll save that for a little later. I have a slide later on that, that focuses on use of optional in fields. Um, optional in method parameters uh, kind of doesn't work the way people really want it to. Um, sometimes people want to define a method where the caller is not required to pass all the arguments. Oh, well, not required means it's optional, right? So I'll use a Java util optional. Well, that, that doesn't work because it, what it does is it makes the caller box every object into an optional. And so if I want to call my method and just pass it a string or no string, I have to write optional.of or optional.empty all over the place. And that, that's, uh, I think that's counterproductive. Um, that, that puts a lot of work out to the caller and for, for no good reason. And then finally with optionals in collections, uh, sometimes, sometimes it's just a little strange. It's like having nulls in collections, but it's worse because instead of, instead of a collection of values, now you have collections of optionals, and then those optionals might be present or empty. And so uh, it's just kind of a very strange to do, thing to do. And uh, it's kind of beyond the scope of this presentation. But if you look at code that puts optionals in collections, then usually it's sort of, if you think about the modeling a little bit, maybe, maybe this should be represented a different way. So one of the things about optional, and one of the th reasons we're concerned about overuse of optional is that Optional is an object, and we call it a box. I mean, it's really nothing, I mean, not much more than a container for a reference to another object. And so uh, people talk a lot about performance. Uh, cloud stuff requires, um, <coughs> you know, higher densities of services in the cloud. People want to use microservices and stuff. So, so even though, you know, who cares? It's only 16 bytes. If you have a lot of these things floating around, the expenses add up. So. One thing I found is that if you, if you take a data structure that has nullable fields and you, you start using optional in it, um, if you overuse optional, then you end up doing a lot more object creation. You add GC pressure. Uh, 16 bytes is not that much for, uh, for an object, but if you have a whole collection of them or if you have lots of objects with optional fields, then those add up. And um, another problem is uh, cache locality, and so if you want to get something, if you have a reference to it, that you might take a cache miss. But if you have to go through an optional, you might take a cache miss getting that optional. And then when you open up the optional to get what's inside of it, you take another cache miss. And so um, this, uh, you know, if you use optional in one place, okay, that's fine. Um, the return position is potentially very optimizable. Um, because the JVM can use escape analysis when it does when it does its JIT compilation and actually potentially avoid even allocating the optional object. But if you start storing optionals into data structures and things, then you, you I think you should. It's not well. I think you should think about these issues. 
it's not necessarily the cause of the ne your next performance problem, but it might be. So it's, it's something to consider. Um, like I said at the beginning of the talk, uh, optional is not a replacement for null. So nulls can and should be used, and they can be made safe if they're well controlled. Um, particularly in the private fields. If you have a class with a private nullable field, then you can do local analysis of that code, and there are tools that help with that to say, yes, this is a nullable field, and it can be, um, um, you can be shown that you're processing or handling the null cases correctly in all cases. Um, an alternative to using null is a, the null object pattern. Um, sometimes that's useful to represent the absence of value um, in, in, uh, in a more convenient way. Um, passing nullable parameters into a method is, is pretty useful. We do that in the JDK sometimes, um, just to avoid adding an extra overload. Um, it's sort of, I say it's declassé, it's not the best API style, but sometimes it's like, okay, it's not too bad if you're writing a library method, okay, this, this parameter is nullable. So you put in a null check at the front and, and, and handle your special case that way, or maybe assign a default value there. Uh, so there's no, no need in those cases to have a, uh, an, uh, an optional param uh, a parameter whose type is optional. All right, so now I want to get into uh, the byte shading phase of this, and I, I'm going to endeavor to avoid uh, using up the entire rest of the time with this, but it, it, it might not be successful. Okay, all right, so um, optional for some reason has been a magnet for uh, for just all kinds of questions and discussions. I'm not going to go through all of these, uh, but there are a couple that I think are notable that are worth discussing. Um, in particular, one thing that comes up repeatedly uh, is a complaint about why optional isn't serializable. And, and that's a fair question, because um, it, I think it, it, the, the design rationale about this has, has not been uh, communicated particularly well. Um, there's lots of email in the open JDK mailing lists, and having all that rationale and discussion buried there is, is totally inaccessible. Um, so what I've tried to do is kind of mine this out and, you know, basically sort of backfill some of the design rationale for this. So anyway, so serializability. All right, so before I talk about serializability, I want to talk a little bit about value types and Project Valhalla. Um, you've probably heard uh, Brian Getz talk about Project Valhalla, the introdu introduction of these new things called value types. Um, so it's sort of like an object, but it has no identity. And it doesn't, it might, but it doesn't necessarily live on the heap. And so you don't have a reference to a value object. You just have a value. And so the, the slogan for Project Valhalla is it codes like a class and works like an int. And so when we created optional, we were, I talked about the potential memory and performance costs of optional. And so we were very concerned about that. And we said, OK, well, if we introduce optional now, maybe we can convert it into a value type in the future when value types come along. So when we, when we decided that, we added kind of a disclaimer to the optional uh, specification in the Java doc. Basically, ah, this is a value-based class, use of identity-sensitive operations such as reference equality, identity hash code, or synchronization on instances of optional may have unpredictable results and should, not be, uh, should be avoided. And so that's rule number seven. Don't use identity-sensitive operations on optionals. Um, okay, so that's sort of background. Now, well, more background, but let's look at the background of serialization. There's a rule in the JDK. JDK has many compatibility rules. And one of them is for serializable objects, the serial form is an external representation that we want to make sure is backward compatible and forward compatible. So that's, that's an elevated level of compatibility. So usually, we say something is backward compatible. So when you upgrade to the new release, the old stuff still works. So, but this way, it, it, for serialization, since it's an external format, it has to go in both directions. So if you serialize an object on an old JDK, you should be able to deserialize it on a new JDK. And if you, de if you serialize an object on a new JDK and go back to an old JDK and deserialize it there, assuming that that object was uh, the, the class was defined in the old JDK, it should be able to, the old JDK should be able to deserialize that as well. And so there are a whole bunch of mechanisms in, in serialization for dealing with presence and absence of fields and constructing custom serial forms and stuff. Um, but a lot of that is in support of the both forward and backward compatibility. 
And that, uh, that actually creates a, a, a considerable maintenance overhead for serializable objects. I think what one of the things that uh, people don't realize is it's not that difficult to take an object and make it serializable. What is difficult is making sure that this compatibility constraint is adhered to across multiple JDK releases. And sometimes we have some very arcane discussions about this where we say, oh, well, let's just add a field here. Well, what happens if it's serialized on an old JDK? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. What should we do? Uh, oh, I guess we can't do that. I guess we'll have to do it a different way. And so around we go. So, so that's actually a, a significant expense and sometimes pr um, produces insurmountable problems. So there's another issue is that serialization really only knows about objects. I mean, it, it also knows about primitives, and then there are a couple special cases for string and enum, but basically, if we had optional and made it serializable, in the external serial form, it would be an object. And serialization depends inherently on object identity. And so in order to reconstruct an object graph at deserialization time, in order to handle things like cycles and, and multiple different objects referring to the same object, ser deserialization preserves that, and in order to preserve that, it has to know about the identities of objects in order to match things up, and also to deal with back references to things that occurred earlier in the serial stream and so forth. So this get, it starts to get really complicated. But what that means is, if we made optional serializable, what would happen when we converted into a value type? So I just said, value types don't have any identity. So if we made it serializable, then, okay, so there's, it's not necessarily an insurmountable problem, but it raises a bunch of questions that we don't have answers to right now. So um, we don't know what the consequences would be in the future for value types if optional were made serializable today. One possibility might be, you know, the compatibility issues are too strong. If we made optional serializable, it can never be a value type, and we're not willing to do that. Um, another alternative is, okay, well, let's say optional, make optional serializable, and it gets converted into a value type, but if you serialize it and deserialize it, then it gets boxed into an object. So it's no longer a value type, it's a boxed object. It's like, hmm, well, that might be okay, that's kind of compatible, isn't it? Well, on the other hand, suppose you have a list of a million of these things and their values, uh, a list of, well, I just said don't do that, but <laughs> um, suppose, you, suppose you serialize some object structure that has optionals in it, and you deserialize it, and you're getting all the benefits of, of value types. But when you deserialize it, what would be the side effects of boxing all of those value types? Well, one, you would, you would greatly increase the, um, the amount of heap that was necessary because instead of being a value type which resides in some object, you'd have a reference to, to somewhere else. Uh, you'd, you'd, deal, you'd have to deal with the um, dependent load latency and cache miss and stuff. And so serializing and deserializing something might have a bunch of side effects on your application that uh, you know, could be a serious problem. And that's not something we're willing to, uh, uh, I mean, that, that seems to be a big risk. If the side effect of serializing, when you serialize and deserialize something, you expect to get the same thing back. And if that has side effects of causing value types to be boxed, that, that seems like a bad idea to me. So anyway, so the upshot is we don't feel confident that we can deal with value types, with optional being a value type in the future, if we were to make it serializable today. So we've held off on making it serializable. So that's the, uh, uh, that's the rationale there. All right, finally, this is the, the slide I promised about fields, and unfortunately, again, I'm running short on time, so I'm gonna have to gloss over this a little bit. Um, I think, I'll, I'll just say that I think the trap that people fall into is this idea that, oh, great, now that we have optional, then we don't, uh, we can use it to replace nulls. And so if they have an object with a bunch of nullable fields, let's replace them all with optionals. And basically, I'm saying that's, that's not a good idea. Instead, I think you should, you should really think about alternatives for, well, maybe using nulls is just fine, but if you want to use something else, maybe you should think about alternatives to converting all of those nullable fields to optionals. Um, 
I know the performance implications, it clutters up the code, and I'm not sure that converting a nullable reference field to an optional field actually buys you anything. I think it, it clutters up your code, uh, in addition to slowing it down and making it consume more memory. So there's been some discussion about this. I will provide links to a couple interesting uh, blog articles. Uh, one is from Stephen Colborn, Optional, a Pragmatic Approach. Uh, so I recommend you read it. He has some interesting advice there. Um, one bit of advice that I think is relevant to this discussion is he says, yeah, don't use optional in fields. Just continue to use nullable fields. But if you want to have optional exposed to your API in your getter, box up the optional at that point. OK, that's one approach. Um, and then there is another article by Mike Ernst, uh, Nothing is Better Than the Optional Type. And uh, I like that title because it's one of those ambiguous things. Um, he's basically claiming you shouldn't use optional at all. You should use null. And actually, his interest in this is he, he, uh, developed the, uh, he and his team developed the checkers framework. And so they have a nullness checker. And what that can do is if you annotate your source code properly, it can, uh, it can verify that you are handling uh, nullable fields or non-nullable fields and va uh, variables correctly. And I think that's a very interesting approach. It's a good alternative. Um, I think it's a, a worthwhile alternative to turning you know, all of your nullable fields into optionals. Um, and so you might think, well, this is, you know, here. I, gave a, I just gave an entire talk on optional. And here, I'm citing some guy who says, don't use optional. So obviously, we, have, we must have had a uh, pitched battle and must have a serious disagreement. Um, no, actually, if you go read that, he, you know, talks about don't use optional here and there. And he says, well, it actually is useful in some cases because in particular cases, you can, you have, you can, you can use the methods on optional and use lambdas to get really nice, concise code. In fact, that's exactly what I said. Use it for those cases. When you have a return type, you can, you can call things like if present on it, and it works great. So my claim is the optional glass is one quarter full, and his claim is the optional glass is three quarters empty. So it turns out, I think, I ha he's a good guy. I had a, a good conversation with him about this. And I think we actually agree quite a bit more than you, you might think we do. All right, so let me wrap this up real quick here. A quick thing about new methods on optional coming in Java 9. Uh, there's a stream method, which I mentioned earlier in a code example. Uh, two new methods are optional.ifPresentOrElse and optional.or. I'm not going to describe exactly what they do. I recommend you go read the Java 9 EA documentation for that. Um, but basically, it just expands the repertoire of methods that you can chain in order to handle more cases for, for dealing with optional. All right, so I will recapitulate the, uh, the main rule here. Limited mechanism, return types, where null is likely to cause errors. And um, on the last slide here, I uh, will summarize all seven rules here. So I'll leave that up for people who want to uh, take pictures of it. And I think we might have time for one question here. If I can get this to come up quickly. All right, well, you know, I'm, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of chatter on here. And I don't quite have enough time to, uh, to really uh, to really do anything. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'll try to answer Twitter. And uh, enjoy the conference.